this to uh, an hour. Um, you know, I know we're all busy people. So listen, this is today's, um, I like to call it um, a live chat bankers forum rather than a, a webinar. Um, and today's, um, you know, this presentation, this webinar came about um, because um, at the Small Business Center, we have just had um, a huge amount of questions surrounding um, banking matters, such as um, the uh, CEBA, the CEBA, as we'll call it, um, the CERB, what other types of assistance are out there for uh, small business owners. And, um, you know, we are business advisors at the Small Business Center, and I know talking to my colleague, John Pollock at LADC, who I'll introduce everyone in a minute, um, you know, a lot of those questions were coming to those organizations and many of the other organizations within our entrepreneurial support network in London. And we thought, you know, what better way than to bring in some of our, 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 our volunteers, our colleagues, our, 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 our friends and our bankers who are the ones who are the experts at this. Um, they are the ones who are managing these things and assisting our clients. Um, we can provide guidance and advice to our clients, but uh, we thought this would be a great opportunity to allow entrepreneurs and business owners such as uh, yourselves to uh, have a forum to have some open discussion and questions with um, our business bankers. So, you know, we're really here for you. I've got a small little presentation and some stuff that I'm, you know, we're going to sort of navigate through, but questions uh, are certainly open. Um, if you want to throw some questions on the chat function um, at any time, throw them up there. Um, and one of my colleagues was sort of going to navigate that. And um, then we're going to open up later where we'll sort of unmute everybody. And if everybody sort of behaves and, and doesn't talk, you know, 10 people aren't talking at once, we can get some good dialogue and conversation going. So first things first, I wanted to introduce um, and introduce everybody. For those who don't know me, myself, my name's Phil Sajeris. I'm a business advisor at the Small Business Center. Um, been there for over six years. Love working with entrepreneurs, supporting small and medium-sized businesses in, in, you know, startup stage to, you know, operational from, you know, one to five years and even beyond that. Um, you know, and, you know, these are, 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 are uh, trying times, very unsettling for business owners. I can't imagine being in the shoes that many of you are uh, with the uncertainty around us. And, you know, the message I always say to, to clients when I meet with them is we're here to help. You know, I hope you get some assistance and guidance from us today, but it doesn't end just at 11 o'clock. We're here beyond that. And all of the people that um, are facilitating and have volunteered their time are here to help too. So let me introduce some of them. Uh, first off, I want to introduce John Pollock from um, uh, LADC, London Economic Development Court. Um, you know, he's got a, a strong background in small bu in business and in business and business supports and those kind of things. And this um, webinar live chat is, is a joint initiative of both the Small Business Center and uh, the London Economic Development Corp. John, did you want to say a couple of things? Um, no, well, I'll, I'll keep it very brief. I think the, the only point I want to emphasize as we go into this is that um, um, everybody that I know uh, has been affected by uh, this, this disruption that we're going through right now. There's been an enormous demand shock, supply shock, there's going to be financial shocks rippling through the system. I think more than anything else, the purpose today is to feel like, uh, you know, what happens on Zoom stays on Zoom. This is your opportunity to ask questions of people in the banking industry that you might be a little reluctant to bring up with your own banker initially, but, you know, here's a chance to kind of feel out, um, you know, what happens if, um, you know, should I do this? And just get some feedback from people who, um, are in the in the space. Um, I would say more than anything else, it's incumbent on everyone to, you know, digest what you hear today and talk to your banker. Uh, be as proactive as you can, and hopefully you'll go in after today armed with some knowledge and some ammunition to have a productive conversation about how you're going to navigate the, the weeks the weeks ahead. Okay, thank you, John. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge my two colleagues from the Small Business Center, Vicky Heredia. And John and Ignacio are here who are helping and, and, you know, we're here to help at any time. And they're uh, my background administrators, admitting people on waiting rooms and, and just helping out here. It's a, it's a whole team uh, initiative. And also I, I see a number of other people from um, LEDC that are, are joined uh, as well. And I'd like to welcome them 
as well um, to the call. And, and lastly, not lastly, but also to the BIAs. I mean, we've seen a lot of support and a lot of clients from all the different uh, business improvement areas across London who are looking for assistance. Um, you know, thank you for the support. Again, we're in this together. We're a community and, and we're here to help. Um, I'd now like to introduce my four banking uh, experts and representatives. Um, the first one is in, in, in no uh, particular order. You're not number one, Mike, but I'm going to start with you. You're number one in my heart. But uh, Mike McIntyre from uh, Libro Credit Union is a representative um, that's joined us today. Uh, Lisa Kraft from Scotiabank um, is a business uh, advisor here to uh, help us uh, through and navigate some of the discussion. Uh, Richard McKenzie from uh, BMO is a uh, business development manager with BMO and, and has a um, strong history and background in business and business banking. And Anthony Aguchi from TD, uh, TD Bank, uh, small business uh, and small business account manager. So, you know, these, these are the ones in the trenches that have been helping out a lot of business owners and those kind of things. So um, that being said, uh, John, can you pull up the presentation uh, for a minute? We'll, we'll go through that and uh, we'll, sh we'll share the screen. Sure, bear with me. Okay. Okay. All you right. See that? So, yep, absolutely. So if you can flip to the next screen, next slide. One second. All right, there's our four banking representatives and their contact information. And I'm happy to share that with everyone uh, later if, if needed. Uh, next slide. So, you know, our title today was uh, Bankers Chat Cash Flow Matters. And, and I don't think I feel I, I need to tell, I, I don't need to tell uh, you the importance as a business owner of um, cash flow. I mean, as we say in, in our business planning teachings and workshop is cash flow is king. And at a time like this over the, you know, since uh, businesses have been either shut down, reduced or whatever, cash flow, um, you know, cash flow is revenues, revenues, money coming in, which has obviously been reduced completely significantly or, you know, somewhat. And cash flow is also expenditures. I mean, it's money coming in and money going out. And uh, although the revenue taps may have been turned off, the expenses are certainly still there for business owners and whether that's uh, rent, labor costs, other fixed expenses, things like that. And we've been advising a lot of clients, you know, review your cash flow, review your cash flow expenditures. Um, you know, uh, take a look at perhaps there are some reductions or things. Obviously, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the assistance that's out there um, and that so, uh, not, uh, so forth. So, Again, uh, I know myself and our colleagues at the Small Business Center have been, have been reviewing um, a lot of cash flow and doing that with our clients, uh, both existing and new. So here's um, a list of the four things that we're going to cover today. What type of funding assistance is available to a business owner? Um, SEBA, which is the Clean Emergency Business Account, which is uh, probably you know, where we're getting a lot of the most, mo most of the questions. Um, CERB, which is the Canada Emergency Response Benefit. Um, CEWS, the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy of 75%. And then we're going to talk about it, a little bit of some of the other uh, um, funding assistance that is available to entrepreneurs. And a couple of them are through EBA, uh, EBA and BDC. Um, certainly not, um, not just limited to those. There are others, and, and certainly our bankers can... Uh, can speak to some of those um, further uh, later on. So, um, John, can you flip to the next slide for us? So, SEBA, the Canadian Emergency Business Account, is a, a government guaranteed loan of $40,000 designed to help small business owners. I'm sure many of you are aware of this. I'm not going to go through um, you know, every word here. It's uh, interest is 0% until December 31, 2022. And the key is a $10,000 loan forgiveness is available provided 30,000 is paid back on or before December 31st, 2022. And if it's not paid by then, um, there's no loan forgiveness and it's, um, it'll be termed out on a three-year term for 5% annual interest, is how I understand. 
and it has to be repaid in full no later than December 31st, 2025. So, uh, next slide, John. Eligibility. This is probably where we're getting the most questions about uh, eligibility for this for this um, this loan. Um, and, and the eligibility requirements, I want you to understand that these are defined by the government of Canada. They're not defined individually by each bank. So one bank doesn't have an eligibility, one, one set of rules compared to another one. Um, you know, so here's a couple things. Uh, the person applying has to have the ability and authority to bind the organization. It has to be a Canadian operating business, not a holding company, in operation on March 1st, 2020. And the payroll expense of the 2019 calendar year was between $50,000 and $1 million. Um, that would be your T4 summary. And this is where we're getting a lot of questions about it. And we'll, we'll get some discussion on that. So, um, John, next slide. Um, the business must have a federal tax registration um, number. The person applying must provide that. Uh, the total employment income in box 14 and the 2019 T4 someone requested upon audit. So, um, you know, here's some of the caveat below is that the, the business will agree to use the funds from this loan to pay for operating costs that cannot be deferred, such as payroll, rent, utilities, insurance, property tax, and regularly scheduled debt service. This is also probably number two where we're getting at most questions is what can I use this money for? And how will this be scrutinized? Who's going to audit it? What if I use it for this purpose and that's not allowed and all these kind of things. So um, I think I got one more slide, John, before I'm going to open it up to the business um, uh, bankers, if you can just forward. Uh, again, here's a few things. The business has an active business checking or operating account at their primary financial institution. So you have to have an active business account at your primary financial institution had to have been opened by March 1st, 2020. Uh, no arrears more than 90 days as of March 1st. Um, you can't apply at any other um, financial institution. You can only apply in one place. Um, post funding surveys, yes. And you intend to operate your business and resume operations. You're not just going to take this money and shut down in, you know, 30 days. Um, and again, the balance must be repaid in full to um, December 31, 2025. So, um, John, if you could just uh, remove the screen um, and we can go back to sort of open conversations. I'd like to, I'd like to open the floor up right now to um, my banking representatives. Um, in terms of um, eligibility uh, requirements, um, you know, where, what are some of the barriers that you are um, hearing from your clients um, that are really um, disqualifying them from applying for this uh, SEBA? So um, why don't I start with um, Mike McIntyre at Libro. Thanks, Bill, and uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for, uh, for joining in on this call. Um, so far, I think what we've been seeing is um, with, with a lot of uh, owners at Libro or clients at Libro, um, some of the eligibility requirements, they're just either falling shy or maybe don't qualify when they're answering the attestation questions. Certain things like elected public officials, um, you know, in the uh, was one, uh, the T4 summary income was another. So unfortunately, uh, when when small business owners are working through some of these application processes, it's kind of pretty black and white, pretty much black and white um, for the qualification period. So there, there's not a lot of uh, adjudication happening um, on these applications. It's kind of either a hit or a miss, unfortunately. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of what we're seeing um, for the most part when, when we're working through this, so. Okay. Uh, Anthony, TD Bank, how about you? Uh, so Mike's point, it, it is very much uh, an if then, right? Like if your payroll is, box 14 is 50,000 to a million, then you qualify. Uh, I'm having clients who purchased a business as an asset purchase midway through 19. Um, so if they were to apply like a prorated formula, you know, they got 30,000 over four months, for example, uh, but those are currently still sitting ineligible. We're also seeing uh, some tech issues and finding that Chrome is the most effective browser uh, to use. Uh, and then the address field is only 15 characters, so you just uh, abbreviate streets and things like that. Um, 
but just connecting with your banker as well uh, to make sure that you have your branch number and your account number proper. You'll pre-fill it with zeros in front just to make sure because um, it's rejecting it and you don't know what it is. It says uh, your application has been rejected and here are some possible reasons. And I found most often when I'm getting those notices from my clients, it's, hey, did you confirm that the branch number is actually you know, 0240 as opposed to 2402. Something, something as simple as that will, will trigger a reject as well. Okay. Um, let's go to Lisa Kraft, Scotiabank. In, in terms of eligibility um, requirements, so, you know, what I'm hearing from a number of my clients are they're not quite at that 50,000 payroll. Um, some of them are, hey, I did 35,000 in payroll and I took 25 in dividend income. Does that qualify me? Yeah, unfortunately, dividend income isn't, and we're finding a lot of people have been doing that because they're paying themselves through dividends, but they pay their employees hourly. And at this time, there is nothing um, to that has come through as changes. I know we're waiting for stuff, so they're not qualifying. We do have some people that haven't finished um, their income right now, and their accountants, I know, are switching them over to payroll for their staff. So you maybe talk to your accountant and see if that is something you can do instead of taking your income for last year out as a dividend. I've had a couple customers tell me they're doing it that way. Um, but yeah, if it's dividend income, unfortunately, you're not qualifying for anything right now at this time. Okay. All right. Um, Richard, Richard McKenzie from uh, BMO. Tell me a little bit about some of the, um, the eligibility requirements um, that, that you're experiencing with your clients or I guess the lack of eligibility or the barriers they're, they're running into. Uh, sure. First of all, everyone can hear me. I just want to make sure of that. Yeah, we're good. Okay, excellent, excellent. And thanks again, Phil and uh, John and, and everyone on the line. Um, uh, I second what everyone said. Yeah, you know, we're all in it together. It's a tough time, but we're all in it together. And especially as your bankers, this is that one time when, you know, you can catch us at home and you probably can have more fruitful conversations if you give someone a call because it's, we're available. Um, you know, we're, we're all, we're all working in from home like you guys are where you have to. So please reach out to your bankers. One thing I'd like to, to, to uh, address um, before I talk about the eligibility stuff, um, Phil, is earlier on, um, just to clarify, my understanding of the, the SIBA facility is it's, it will be termed out after December 31st, 2020, is what I've uh, confirmed in my internal documentation I've reviewed. I think at the outset of the call, um, we were kind of, everyone's learning on the fly. We knew that at December 31st, 2022, if the balance remaining was uh, of the 40,000, if you were advanced 40,000 was 10,000, that 25% remaining balance is eligible for forgiveness. Um, so that, that is one thing I've kind of learned internally in my research because we're all learning on the fly. But what I've also uh, understood is that it'll act as a revolving line of credit up until December 31st, uh, 2020. So I think most banks are advancing the full 40,000 into people's accounts. It makes sense in a way because it's zero percent interest. But at the same time, if you don't want that money just floating in the account, you can put it back on the line of credit um, knowing that you can redraw on it up to December 31st, 20, and then after that, the balance is turned out. That's my understanding. So I want to make sure everybody knows how the process and the procedure works, because you don't want to get caught in a situation where you need the cash, you haven't advanced the cash off your line of credit, and then it's no longer no longer re-advanceable after December 31st, 20. Okay. Um, on the eligibility side, a um, few things. Number one, all the banks worked with the uh, with the government to build this application kind of uniformed across all banks. So it's, a, it's definitely a bank application, online application that all, all the IT departments of all the banks had to work with to kind of build to make it work succinct across all banks. Some of the things we're seeing because of that is a lot of times, I, what everyone has said so far is correct. Um, the eligibility, you know, that, uh, that my colleagues at the other banks spoke of, uh, we're experiencing as well. Some other things too that are causing ineligible stuff is some technical matching. Uh, bottom line is there could be an instance where you're classified as ineligible, but you meet all the criteria, but the bank systems um, are used to edit some of the fields and some of the, the information, and it may be that the bank systems aren't um, updated to what you're entering. So that could be an issue. It could just be a validation issue. Otherwise, from an eligibility standpoint, yeah, the, the T4, 50 to 50,000 to 1 million, 
Um, the latest is as of Tuesday this week, I read that uh, the government's well aware that you know several small businesses don't pay their their staff that way or their their leadership that way on um, their management. So they're looking at the including the um, the dividend structure and so forth. But at this time, we have to go by the, the edits as they've been delivered. So that's that's the major thing. You know, there's other things that could come into play, like if an account is dormant. Um, or, you know, there are, there is a statement that if the account is delinquent, uh, you, you have any kind of delinquencies that could cause an ineligible, um, uh, response, and then you'd have to get in touch with your bank. So I'll kind of leave it there. Cause I think my colleagues kind of covered off the other stuff. So I'm going to just pass it on to Anthony from TD because I know what you said about 2020, December 31st and what I've sort of heard. That's a little bit different, and I don't know, Anthony. What are you, and perhaps some of the other bankers can jump in on that, Anthony. So the the program was was basically forty thousand and zero percent, and then it was left up to the banks as to how they'd like to actually administer the distribution of funds. Uh, TD has elected actually a single advance loan with a term reducing facility at the end. So if you were to lump sum back onto that loan, you would not be eligible for readvance. Um, on TD side. So I would encourage all the business owners applying for SEBA, check with their individual banker and say, confirm with certainty, hey, are these funds readvanceable or are they not? I can confirm that they would not be readvanceable because it's treated as a term loan facility on the credit profile for the business. So if you're concerned about cash flow or overspending that money, uh, best thing that I can recommend is open a no fee business savings account, scroll the funds in there until you actually need to draw it down and effectively create your own kind of line of credit. But I would not uh, encourage readvancing or lump sum paying uh, unneeded funds right out the gate without confirming with your individual bank whether or not you're going to be able to access them back. Um, I would hate to see somebody take 40, think, hey, maybe I only need 25 advance 15,000 back and then fall short um, because you're not going to be eligible to reapply later. Um, so if you're worried about overspending in your checking account, um, a business savings account would have a no fee and you can literally just squirrel the funds over there and kind of lock it up separately. Yeah, um, but please check with your individual institution. Yeah, I, that's great to know. Uh, it's Richard here from BMO because BMO does allow you to re advance up to December 31st, uh, 2020. That's, that's the way our platform is built. We we do the same thing, um, Anthony. We we advance the forty thousand up front because it, it isn't it isn't uh, it isn't a problem. There's no interest being charged, so we're not put, putting any undue burden when we advance the forty thousand. But um, to your point, then the great suggestion. You know, if you don't need the money, maybe you can get a little bit of interest. But I can confirm from the BMO system side, it's uh, it's definitely we that you can re it, we treat it as a line of credit. Um, until December 31st, 2020. So you can put the money back on the line and draw on it as you wish up until December 31st, 20. And then if the balance is termed out of the line of credit, that's how BMO is managing this, uh, this facility. Okay, so let's obviously the message there is, is each individual uh, finance institution is managing it um, a little bit differently. So, you know, Deal, you know, speak to your representative, your business banker, and uh, you know, find a solution that is best for you and for your business. Um, getting back to eligibility requirements, what I do want to speak to is that, you know, 50,000 um, minimum payroll, okay? So, um, you know, obviously the government rolled this out a couple weeks ago, um, this program. Um, that's what they came up with. That was the criteria, the eligibility criteria. Um, that it had to be a minimum payroll of 50,000 on your 2019. You know, there are many businesses and people that are falling through the cracks for various reasons. Some might have a payroll of only 40 or 45 and they're like, please, please, I need this. Others might have had some, some payroll, a salary income, some dividend income that's greater than 50. Uh, we had some examples of a, a person that just bought a business back in September um, did an, a an asset purchase instead of a share purchase, had a $20,000 payroll in the last quarter of 2019. And if they, if they prorate that over a full year, that would be 80, but their 2019 payroll is really only showing 20,000. That deems them ineligible. In our conversations with um, some of our government representatives and, and um, uh, local MPs, um, they, they understand that there are gaps. Um, the message coming from their offices are, yes, they do understand this. They are working towards resolving some of these. Um, they, they are reaching out to organizations like ourselves and LEDC asking 
for, um, you know, where are the gaps identified? What are you hearing? They're trying to find resolution to this. Now, what they're going to do with that in relation to the SIVA, I am not sure. Will they reduce the minimum from 50 to 40? Will they start including some dividend? Will they accept prorated? I don't know. Um, I certainly encourage each and every one of you to reach out to your local MPs um, personally as an individual entrepreneur. If you are in one of those situations to, to lobby to them uh, on your behalf, we as an organization, a small business center, and I know John Pollock from LADC and I had this conversation yesterday is maybe we should collectively um, lobby um, the levels of government, the federal government for this program specifically um, to make change. And we can see how, um, you know, even yesterday, the government, federal government, Trudeau announced um, um, the uh, CERB benefit. They announced changes to that, which I'm going to get into in a few minutes, uh, where they are, they're allowing now up to uh, individuals to earn up to $1,000 in income per month, whereas previously they, so they are understanding that they're identifying the gaps. Whether they do make change or not, I don't know, but certainly we can lobby on their behalf. So um, next, next thing I want to address with um, a question I want to open up to the bankers again is, let's talk about use of funds. So I get this 40,000. I apply, I, I, I'm, you know, uh, it's in my, my, my bank account. I've got 40,000 uh, lump sum or whatever. However, it's administered by my financial institution. Um, use of funds. I mean, I've had a number of people, you know, it's, it's loosely defined as operating expenses. Um, I don't know if that's loosely definition, but, um, uh, you know, operating expenses such as labor costs, uh, uh, rent, fixed expenses, those kind of things. Um, what if I want to buy a new piece of equipment with it? What if I want to use it for some other purposes? What about debt financing? What about helping me service some of my other debt that I might have a, a lease or a loan on some equipment or a building or something like that? Um, is that allowable? Mike McIntyre, I'll start with you. Thanks, Phil. Um, yeah, I mean, the primary design, I think, of this, this loan is obviously, and you kind of stated it in your presentation, is to help with your uh, existing expenses. Um, I've had a few inquiries about uh, same kinds of things, you know, can I buy a new piece of equipment and that kind of stuff. I would think that the capital purchases, this program really isn't designed to help with any capital purchases within the, within the business. Uh, this is really to try and help uh, those businesses that are really struggling with the cash coming in and the expenses still coming out. So I, I think it's, you know, you, you should have a very well managed plan for this, uh, for these funds. I think uh, taking a good look at your business and trying to, um, you know, forecast out, I guess we all don't know how long this is going to last, um, you know, whether it's a month, two months or three months. And then there's obviously the, the um, uh, getting, getting the businesses back up and running and, and sort of uh, the bounce back from that. Um, but I would say, to, you know, take a look at, um, you know, trying to reduce expenses. Uh, look at your expenses month over month. Uh, take a look that on what you're going to need and maybe where you can reach out to certain individuals to uh, to look at some expense reductions um, over the course of the, well, while we work through all of this. So I know that there's relief out there for things like your, your GST, your HST payments. Uh, you could have some rent relief if you're paying rent. Uh, some utilities are looking at um, some programs. So so I would say have a very structured, well-managed plan for the forty thousand um, dollars, rather than just um, you know sort of sort of free will with it. I guess um, the hard part is you know we don't know how long we're in this, right? So yeah. um, so being very calculated, I think would uh, yeah would, would make a whole lot of sense. So it'd be a lot easier if we had a, a date that we could say we're ready, we're going to be reopening on, but unfortunately we do not know that date. So uh, Lisa. Craft from Scotiabank, did you want to add anything to that in terms of fund usage? They can use like um, the funds also to make regular loan payments, mortgage payments and that type. I think you're talking about lowering their debt costs and stuff like that. Yeah. My understanding, we're um, issuing it as a lump sum, but it is a line of credit. So ours uh, will fluctuate if needed. We're telling most people either to t when the 40 is deposited, maybe put it in a savings account or a cashable GIC if they don't need it right away. So they do have access to it at a later date um, and try and spread it out. Again, same, make sure your rent, your payroll, 
pull anything so you're not having to shut your doors permanently. Um, and we're also offering, uh, we're trying, we're keeping track on our system who's applying because we're also offering on their mortgages um, and loans relief for three months where it's, they just pay the interest only, we'll waive all the principals. Um, we're also looking at visa cards. Anybody should be calling in on their visa cards directly, not into the branches, but um, I know with us, you call visa directly and they're also doing some uh, relief with the minimum payments and things like that monthly to get it down. And they're also lowering the rate. They'll tell you the stipulations on that, um, on the lowering part. So there is other options. Everybody should, whether you need it or not, you might want to do it now because it's, you don't want to get behind the eight ball because then it's harder to get approved for a lot of these things. Um, do it up front and take the three months if you want now. Don't wait until you're behind because once you're behind, with, it makes it our job a little harder to get these approved for you. So if you think you're going to have some problems, call your banker and uh, let's get it all in place right now while they're willing to get it all ready for you. And it's pretty simple. Just three questions we ask and we can probably get a lot of your payments moved around. Right. Okay. Um, I just want to, I want to jump over to some of the questions and, and, and chat uh, stuff going on. And maybe we can address some of those. First one I noticed um, was uh, someone who said they went to TD Bank and asked about a $40,000 loan, told they had to go to the government site. And the government site says, go to your bank. Um, Anthony, TD Bank, is it through your online banking? Do the government site just, uh, how, how do you respond to that? Uh, so it's actually through td.com slash business relief that used to be the COVID-19 and then they just switched it over to business relief. Anyone that has an email address on the TD system would have been sent out the link on to actually how to apply. So it might be the case where it was an external site, but the actual like um, SIBA application is entirely external uh, and it's not done through, through us at all. My information on it is, is minimal other than I can confirm your branch, your account number, um and just kind of review eligibility but otherwise it's td.com slash business relief is where yeah. you'd access it most that's easily. what i've heard too from uh, a number of you not just with td that it is a fairly simple process once you get on as long as you have that information your business registration numbers and you can confirm your your t4 summary and that those kind of things you have to have that information in front of you so um scotia is the same and it takes about maybe 10 minutes and you're approved just to let people know though, uh, one of the phone calls that I'm getting quite a bit this in the last couple of days, once you get it done and it tells you you're approved, everybody thinks they have to come into the branch to sign documents. You don't need to do that. They actually send you the document with your e-signature on it. So there's nothing left to do and it takes five days to advance the funds. So it's not in your account immediately because they're gonna do some audit in those five days to make sure everything's okay, but you'll get your approval usually in 10 minutes. Five days later, it'll go into your account, but they will send you an email with everything you need and your requirements on it. That is your loan documents for it. Okay. Uh, other question, um, does BMO have an application up on their site yet? Richard? Uh, yes, yes, we do. Uh, that went up on, that went up on uh, I believe, Monday. Monday we went live and it is, a, it is, it is accessible through the online banking platform. Um, so we don't direct people. We have a direct link um, built through the the online banking platform to, to to select it, and then it gets into the to the application process. Okay. And so that is that is exactly. Another follow up question: There is it better to do it over the phone with BMO staff? Uh, no, no. I for this type, I, to, as as my colleague said from Scotia and uh, Lilo and so forth, um, it's a pretty straightforward process. So you will you will you will lose time to try and get in touch with someone in my opinion on the phone um you should just go into the online banking site and uh select the link because like i said it's, it's been it's been built fully automated um the the metrics we had as of monday morning when we went live uh in the last week was uh 80 percent um success rate um and 20 percent that had ineligible feedback um were being addressed and some of them were uh, some of them were actually ineligible for a reason when investigated they found out and or um, something to do with we had to do uh, some kind of tweaking in our internal system maybe to address the, an edit on a field or, or the client had uh, in, in, invalid information entered. So it, it's definitely online is the best place to start. If, you, if, some, if there's an issue, call, 
call the contact, but online is your quick and fast way to get it done for okay. sure. Okay, next yeah, question. And if I, if I, Next question right. in the chat was um, getting questions from new businesses operating less than one year who don't meet the payroll threshold. Will this be prorated for them? I, I addressed this a little bit earlier and uh, at the present time, as it is my understanding, no, it's not being prorated, but it is certainly something that is under consideration in, in, in our conversations with, uh, with uh, MPs and, and government representatives. So I, I think that one. And one of the last ones, somebody spoke, mentioned a rent relief. Um, um, I think Mike McIntyre, you might have mentioned something about rent relief. In, in, is there a specific rent relief program that anyone is aware of? Um, I, I'm not aware of any other than, you know, negotiating with your current, um, you know, landlord. Um, I, I don't believe there's anything. Any, uh, any of the bankers want to speak to that or John or LEDC, anyone heard of any other specific rent relief programs? Lisa from Scotia, we haven't heard anything. We just have the, if they own the property, we can waive their payments, but I haven't heard anything. Most people are contacting their landlords right now. Yeah. I know there's- yeah, I'll, I'll add to that. It's, uh, it's, it's Richard, so I'll add to that and keep in mind that um, your landlords um, are eligible in most, most cases nowadays. We're all in it together again for some kind of mortgage relief, as Lisa pointed out. So it's worth a call to your landlord um, because the, depending on what kind of relief they get, you know, most are willing. I, I'm finding that everyone's kind of being good to each other and, uh, you, you really should get in touch with your landlord. And even in addition to that, don't underestimate things like your insurance. Um, if you call, I've had a lot of people call their insurance brokers or their insurance reps and, and even insurance companies are, are, are working to either extend you a couple months next year, uh, if you have to maintain payments and, or willing to kind of reduce some of the payments depending on the insurance structure. So to everyone's comment, stress your cash to, cash flow and look for opportunities of expenses you have going out and make those phone calls. It's really important. Yeah, and I you will may miss out on something. I will speak to an organization out there called Save Our Business. And I know downtown London has been sending out um, um, uh, petitions and surveys that there is a strong um, lobbying of all levels of government to provide uh, rent relief and rent abatement to landlords to in turn pass it on to their tenants. Um, you know, this is a uh, um, uh, certainly something that is, is uh, should be strongly considered. I know at this point, I, I don't even know if it's gotten to committee stage yet at, uh, at uh, the government level, but certainly um, there is a, there's a strong push for that. I've read through it. I've signed the petition personally. I'm, I'm in full support of it. Um, I think a lot of the business owners uh, were at the mercy of our landlords. And as Richard said, you know, most landlords, I would say the majority of them are being um, uh, um, compassionate and empathetic to the position business owners are in but there are a few dogs out there that are not and uh, i spoke to somebody yesterday and it's uh it is scary and it's uh it's uh you know it raises the anxiety so um okay uh, a couple other questions Phil, just a quick question uh answer that i found out through um another colleague if you have your insurance on your business, you should give your broker a call because I guess there is insurance they might not know they have, but for this situation that pays out some of the policies that they have. So they should check on their policies to see if there's anything built in um, for this type of thing because of uh, it's not their own it, it, because it's a yeah. pandemic. So there are policies. So depending on their policy, they should call and check with the broker to see if there is anything that will help them also. Luna, or Millie, Millie. Um, I've, I, we've been recommending that to all our uh, clients as well. Um, I have not heard of any clients that have been successful in acquiring any, um, any assistance from their insurance, financial um, payouts or anything like that. But uh, anyway, the other thing too. Explore it. Yeah, the other thing too, just so everybody knows too, you should, if you're not running your vehicles and that for your business and stuff, call your insurance broker, you have to call them, but they are giving rebates. I've had quite a few people getting rebates because they're not, they're not running their equipment and things like that. So um, they're getting, at, I've had a couple of people get retroactive back to March um, discounts on their insurance because they're uh, not as liable because say you have vans and things like that out, you're not using them. 
and see if you can get some money refunded back. I've had a couple of people tell me they've got it back. Good point, good point. Okay, um, listen, at this point, I see a couple more questions on chat room. Um, you know, I know SIBA is um, the, the business account is probably the hottest topic of, of most recent. What I'd like to do is open it up. If anyone, is anybody out there, would they like to speak specifically to it and ask a question live rather than putting on chat? If anyone is, maybe you can raise your hand or uh, um, let me know. We can unmute you or uh, that kind of stuff. I'm not sure. I see Annie. Annie, I'm, I, go ahead. Can you hear uh yeah, yeah. I just uh, uh, sent a question. You might have seen that, uh, you know, of course, I am not eligible to get that $40,000 uh, because I, I didn't complete my, I don't have, you know, 50,000 payrolls, uh, you know. So uh, this is what uh, I was looking over the, um, uh, over, over the website. So there is some other thing I saw that BDC, BDC co-lending program. So I don't know whether all of us, can apply and what are the eligibility for that? I don't. I have no. If anybody can uh, let me know about that, that would be wonderful. Okay, great question. I know that's something we were going to cover. Richard, do you want to speak to uh, that a little bit about BDC lending and what might be available for businesses such as Ani? Uh, sure, sure, sure. Uh, great question, Ani, and and it's a question that we're all anticipating in answers to. Um, uh, the first the first program that everyone was working on was the SIBA, the forty thousand. So my understanding, uh, the latest update I have uh, from a BMO National Call perspective is um, this week they were focusing on both the EDC guarantee program and the BDC co-lending program, which are the other avenues the government uses to support all of us through this um, are going to. Uh, the way the BDC program is designed to work, to my knowledge, and again, we'll all find out together um, in the next week or so because they should go live within the next two weeks. Um, is it is a co-lending program. So you don't deal with BD. BDC um, may have their own facility or their own offers and their own structures to help entrepreneurs right now, uh, like yourselves. Um, the co-lending program, you deal with your lead bank. So whether you're with TD, BMO, CIBC, RBC, Libro, uh, at whoever you may be with, to my knowledge, um, you strictly deal with, with your lead bank um, you don't get involved with BDC documentation and BDC sign-offs or anything like that. And what it is, is it's a joint program where the government recognizes right now that with the issues at hand, revenues are down, deposits are down, and so forth, which is what feeds into the ability for banks to lend somewhat, um, that to keep the capital flowing, to keep loans being issued, um, they have to help. So the, but the bottom line is the, the program is a concept where the government will fund up to 80% of a, of a loan that the bank approves under this co-lending program. And that makes it more palatable for the bank to approve and to go forward and so forth. That said, we don't know right now, um, Annie, what the criterias are. Um, you know, is it, is it standard bank adjudication, which means that we're going to look at your business and we're going to say, can you afford a $50,000 loan repayment over 10 years? Um, you know, we're not trying to fund into a situation where we put you in a situation where you can't make loan payments. That's a principle of, of what every bank, no one wants that. So uh, to my knowledge right now, it's a 10-year amortization. So that makes it more palatable in that way again. Um, because, you know, normally banks wouldn't go that long on a loan, which means that the monthly payments will be much less, which means the loan will be much more affordable, which means that it should be much more eligible for smaller businesses who are ramping back up and need to get their cash flow going, need to start sales and revenues and profitability, which in turn pays back the loans. It'll make it more palatable for you. But it is, it is, a, it is the bank's decision as to, as to approve the loan in the co-lending facility, and it's up to you, Annie and team on the phone, to put together like strong cash flow projections um, and forecasts, most of all for yourselves, so you can sleep at night um, to see that if I borrow a loan for 50,000, 100,000, whatever the number is, it, it, it's very, it, I'm speaking small numbers now, but it does go up to $5 million, uh, depending on the size of the company. Um, you know, make sure that you know that over a 10-year amortization, you know, the monthly payments will be X, I can afford it, right? So that's what the banks will be uh, approving on. 
um, along with the fact that the banks know that their exposure when they lend this money is only 20%. So I think it'll be aggressively put out there, but we just, I don't know. I, I have not I have a call tomorrow um, to find out. Apparently we're getting some details tomorrow from a BMO perspective as to what how it's being structured. But the key thing is it's a 10 year loan. So that means that the monthly payments will be much less. And uh, it's, 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 a, it's a loan with your financial institution you deal with now where BDC funds 80% of what they approve to help you get through this time and to grow your business. All right, thanks. Uh, Annie, any uh, questions to that or? Oh, oh, yeah, that's what I was looking for because uh, thank you so much. Anyone else got to uh, want to bring out a question? Raise your hand or? I can't, Vicki, if you can sort of manage it too, I can't uh, see if anyone's uh, raising hands. Okay, let's go to um, go back to the chat because I saw a couple other questions on the chat there. Um, let's take a look here. Um, there's a question about um, with regard to the SEBA about equipment to allow you to access online marketing. Um, that would be for the SEBA. I think that would certainly be appropriate use of funds. Do you guys, uh, bankers, sort of agree with that? I would believe so because yeah. most yeah. places have to turn over to use the online stuff to keep going and working, keeping their employees. Okay. Uh, question yeah, yeah. here. Uh, to add to that, Phil, to add to that, Phil, sorry, it's, it's not it's not monitored by the banks or as to how you use that forty thousand. Yeah. It's not audited, that, right? So so the key is to do a cash flow stress test. Call, get out as many mortgage deferrals as you can, as many loan deferrals, as many visa deferrals. Get, get, minimize how much money you have to put out based on the offers out there now. And then maybe you can use some of the 40,000. This might be an opportunity for some people, right? Because if you manage through and you structure yourself well, you know, this, is, this, is, this, this could be something that helps your business rebound a little quicker, depending on, you know, the use of the funds. And great word, key word there, opportunity. This is an opportunity for a lot of businesses in, in, in uh, you know, not only helping them survive, but helping them relaunch and help them, you know, uh, ready to open back up again. It's Lisa, again, I, and the same thing I've heard. If they need equipment and that to keep moving when they're going, uh, trying to move forward with their business, I do not believe it's going to be an issue. They're more worried, from my understanding, the government of people frauding, doing things they shouldn't be doing to get it, than uh, where you're spending your money. They're not going to ask you to give it detailed. From my understanding, they can't go through 100,000 tax returns to yeah, see every little nickel. About scrutinization and auditing. How much, how, who's doing it? Is it the bank or the government? And to what degree and what level? So. Yeah, the banks aren't looking at it. And who knows, you might need a whole new computer system because you got to do everything online now. Who's yeah. going to say you can't buy yeah. it? Yeah. Okay. From, from the online standpoint, the, uh, who's talking? Uh, Sorry. Go ahead, Mike. I think it's Mike or right, Anthony. Anthony, you got oh, something? I was just going to say from the online standpoint, like reach out to your merchant provider. Uh, a lot of them, so with TD Merchant Solutions, if you're primarily, let's say your food services business and you're prim a predominantly, um, you know, debit and credit, reach out to your merchant solutions and talk to them about e-commerce to actually build in a payment solution into your site or reducing your actual terminal fee on your merchant. Uh, I know that we're actually doing a little bit of uh, kind of discount on those because now restaurants and food services, uh, quick in and outs are doing more takeout. Um, or through Skip the Dishes or Uber Eats. So the payments aren't coming through their merchant system anymore. Uh, and then there's actually, uh, they're doing a lot of work with e-commerce as they know the businesses are migrating more to online payment methods. So reach out to your mer merchant solutions provider and just say, hey, uh, from an e-commerce standpoint, from a monthly service fee standpoint on my, on my debit, uh, we've, things are changing in terms of how people are getting paid. Uh, so your merchant solutions should be partnering with you to, to kind of get the best fix in place for that. Okay. Um, next question. Yeah. Thanks, Anthony. Um, it was related to the the uh, wage subsidy program, um, the seventy five percent wage subsidy. When when will this be open for application? Um, I don't have the answer to that. Do any of the bankers or is anyone else on the call have, have they got any idea of where that when that will be uh, opening up? We haven't received anything at Scotia, but I know they're having a meeting. I think today or tomorrow about it. Okay. Um, yeah. okay. again, keep an eye out for that information. Certainly our organization 
and um, LADCs. There's lots of COVID support information out there. Um, you know, certainly once we have it, we'll be posting it to our websites and sending it out there. If that is something you're certainly interested in, um, there is uh, there, there there is a lot of eligibility requirements, or not a lot, but you have to check a lot of boxes, as my understanding is, to qualify for that program. Um, next um, next question, we talked about the BDC. Um, on March 25th, the government asked non-essential business to close for 14 days. Was that extended another 14 days from April 8th, or is it in depth at this point? Um, my understanding, they just announced another 28 days this week, which is going to take us to May 14th, I believe. Um, I might be a couple days off on the calendar, but um, anyone on the call want to uh, address that, or are they, do they have any specific responses to that? I did see something saying May 28th, so I don't, I'm not too sure that Ford was looking at putting Ontario down till then. Okay. So I'm not too sure yet. I know we're at least in the mid-May, yeah. I believe. Now, I did send you those links, Phil, that page with all the government links. Uh, people can go on there and go directly because the government will update yeah. the Ontario and the federal right onto their web pages if uh, people need it. Okay. So they can check. I'm happy to share that with anyone if they'd like to reach out to us after any one of us as well. So um, any more questions related to SEBA before we go on? We've got about eight minutes left and uh, I can address a couple of the other things. John, can you throw that um, presentation back up and where we were? Um, unless there are some other questions. What I want to speak about now is the CERB, the Canadian um, Canada Emergency Response Benefit which was announced uh, oh probably about a month ago that's that two thousand dollars per month um if you could advance the slide there john um it's a flat rate two thousand bucks a month for up to four months that's how they've got it now it is a ta it is taxable um no tax is being taken directly from the payment so you have to understand that is income for you uh on your 2020 tax return um, who can apply eligibility? Um, so workers uh, who have lost their job, sick, quarantined, taking care of someone who's sick with COVID, working parents staying home to care for children, are still employed but not receiving any income. And you'll see there in bright red, I put in, and they just announced it yesterday, new, you can earn up to $1,000 per month. So this is where, you know, when the original the government launched this, a lot of people were falling through the cracks. They said, well, you know what, I've lost 90% of my income because my bricks and mortar store isn't open anymore. I'm still doing about 10% through e-commerce and I'm hoping to build on that and expand on that. Um, but this deems me ineligible for this. So they are allowing up to now to earn $1,000 a month. I know that's not a huge amount, um, but um, certainly it, it does, it's, it's going to pre-qualify some people that were previously slipping through the cracks. So um, next slide, John. Um, you had to have an income of at least $5,000 in 2019 or the 12 months prior. Um, could be any type of income, employment, self-employment, dividends from a business tax at the small business rate. And you're expected to be without employment or self-employment for at least 14 consecutive days in the initial four week period. And this does apply to wage earners, contract workers, self-employed individuals who would otherwise not be eligible for EI, including sole proprietors. Okay, so that is the um, CERB. Um, any questions on that? Um, maybe John, can you remove that and I can look and see if there are any questions related to, uh, to the CERB. I see here as a BIS, um, there's one coming here. I'm currently planning to do wage subsidy, but can I piggyback the CERB in the future months? So you're currently doing a wage subsidy, um, but can I piggyback the CERB in future months? So that's a good question. Um, again, I, I, if you are the business owner, are you drawing a salary from the business and are you included in that wage subsidy? Um, I'd have to learn a little bit more. Any one of the bankers want to address that or do they have any knowledge on that uh, that they can speak to? Not on this end, they haven't given us much because that's all run through the government programs. Yeah. Again, I would go back to that website link that I sent. Um, it should be on there. But I would think if you're getting wage subsidy for your employees and you're not, that you can most likely 
get the 2000 for yourself. Yeah, I, um, um, I'm certainly happy to look into that further for the person asking that question. Um, I, I, I won't feel comfortable right now answering yes or no to that. I think uh, there's, there's a, you know, some gray area there that we've got to look further into. And seeking the advice of, of you know, again, when it comes to the wage subsidy, um, we've been recommending speaking to your accountants as well. I mean, they're the experts in this kind of stuff too. So um, yeah, so Kay Singer, I'm happy to speak to you further about that one um, following today's session or anytime. We can do a little bit more research on that. So any further questions with related to CERB? Okay. Um, Next, uh, John, can you throw that presentation up? The next slides were just all about the uh, the wage subsidy, which we've addressed a, a little bit about. Uh, again, the details on this have, have not come forward yet. This is what I've been able to to um, to grab from the government websites. Um, you know, who is eligible, um, what you must have experienced, a 15% reduction of your gross revenue in March and or 30% reduction in gross revenue in April or May. Okay, obviously businesses were open, some or many were open for parts of March um, until the official shutdown happened. Um, next slide. Um, how you calculate a reduction in revenue. This is just, there's two options here. Um, you can compare your revenue for the month you wish to receive the subsidy, your revenue for the same month in the previous year, and you show either your 30 or 15% decrease. Um, as the subsidy is for salaries paid since March 15, the three claiming periods, so there are three claiming periods right there. Or there's an option too, which seems a little bit more, um, I don't want to say confusing, it's like, it's like that H, GST, HST, quick method type of uh, stuff, but you know it can work for something. And again, it's uh, something you should look into um, and perhaps work with your accountant on it. Um, you compare your gross revenue for the month you want to receive it to the gross revenue from January and February, um, and choose that option. Once you choose that option, you're committed to that. Um, again, like I said in bright red there, it says there are more details coming, um, and hopefully that is uh, going to be sooner. Um, you know, maybe early th or this week or early next week. So I think, uh, was there one more slide, John? Oh, it was about the maximum. Then compare that 75% maximum of 847 per week. Um, so uh, we spoke a little bit um, towards, um, if you can go to the next slide, John. Sorry, we're almost just wrapping up some of the other mm -hmm. assistance. Um, I've got EBA on there, which I don't know why that is. It should be EDC. Um, uh, BDC, we spoke to that a little bit. And other, um, you know, again, things such as rent relief. Um, you know, City of London is uh, looking at, uh, you know, to pay uh, property tax deferrals. Uh, WSA, WSIB has got some deferrals. Um, utility, uh, London Hydro and some things are looking at some uh, deferrals, rent or utility relief, things like that. A lot of details are still not released, but you know, certainly, you know, this is your livelihood. This is your scope of business. This is something you got to keep your pulse on. And as I said earlier, we, um, as an organization, both SBC and LEDC will be on top of this kind of stuff. And, uh, this is what, um, this is what, uh, you know, we're, how we're helping our clients. So, uh, one last question. Would I provide an uh, email to the slides today? Happy to do so. Um, I will do that uh, sometime later this afternoon. Um, okay, John, if you want to remove the uh, slides there. Phil, um, what I know in our area, um, some people should be contacting to their Chamber of Commerce. Um, I know in the Oxford County area, they... Uh, through, I think it's called Ventures Capital or something, they're offering $30,000 loans. Even if you're not a chamber member, they're offering uh, other loans for businesses right now, small businesses in their community. So I'm sure there's one for Middlesex County and all Elgin County and things like that. So you might want to check the chamber, your London yeah. Chamber of Commerce point. website. And I know there are, um, you know, there's there's lots of discussion going on about supporting Main Street businesses, bricks and once things, you know, food service, restaurants uh, being decimated. Um, restaurants Canada, there's a lot of talk and, and, and 
there's a lot of mobilization at those organizations on how, um, how they can help, how we can help them, how government can help them, how all levels of government, how customers and, and clients can help them. So, you know, there's a lot of stuff out there. There's a, again, like, uh, you know, I think we mentioned this at the beginning, John Pollock uh, mentioned it is, you know, this is community. We're here as a community of, of business owners and, and entrepreneurs and we're here to support it. You're not alone. You're not doing this uh, uh, on an island by yourself. Um, and um, certainly we're here to provide some assistance and guidance. So, um, yeah, that being said, I see 1101 on my clock. I'd like to thank everybody, uh, my, my, our expert panelists, the bankers, for giving us an hour of their time. I'd like to thank uh, John Pollock and the LEDC team as well for, uh, for assisting and helping out, and my colleagues from the Small Business Center and um, all the BIAs as well and people. So thanks very much. Please feel free to reach out to us. Our, our contact information is all on our website, LEDC website, and all of these, uh, uh, these banking representatives, I'm happy to provide their information. I'll send you out these slides, um, PowerPoint presentations, so you'll have their contact info, and I'm sure they'd be happy to hear from you. So that being said, have a great day, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us, and uh, stay in touch. We might be running a, another one like this uh, perhaps in the next few weeks, and we've got all sorts of other uh, webinar topics that we are working on. So have a great day.